This is episode 129 of the XY podcast with Rohit Agava. In the startup world, adversity is pretty much a given. We always hear about the success of a company, but rarely do we ever hear about the often stressful and volatile journey they undertook to get there. Rohit Agava is the voice behind the Startup Playbook podcast. He's an entrepreneur himself and has seen both failure and success in his own startup business ventures. In this episode, Adrian from XY and Rohit explore the many facets of startup life, including tech, relationship building versus transactional conversations, new ways of engaging your client base and prospects, as well as some of the most interesting and amazing conversations Rohit's had with guests on his own podcast. We really hope you enjoy the many ideas and stories shared in this episode. And as always, if there's something we can be doing to make your podcast experience even better, drop us a line at xyadvisor.com. This podcast is brought to you by Salesforce, blaze new trails to richer client relationships with the world's number one CRM. Salesforce has designed the Financial Services Cloud to help you make every interaction personalized through rich client profiles centered on personal goals and pivotal life events. You can nurture deeper relationships with proactive tracking and event alerts that remind you to reach out when clients need you the most. Supercharge your productivity by managing client engagements, household relationships, and financial life goals all from the one connected platform. It's the world's number one CRM imagined just for wealth management. Salesforce is excited to partner with XY Advisor to discuss how you can build richer client relationships and unlock loyalty. I'm pretty pumped. We've got Rohit from the Startup Playbook. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's, he's got a podcast himself, so I'm a little, a little bit... Um, a little bit nervous about whether I'm going to be able to um, be up to his standards because I've, I've listened to his podcast and it's a pretty good, uh, pretty well done, uh, done thing. So uh, thank you for coming on. No, I was about to say thank you. I, I'm worried that I might not answer questions and just start ask firing questions your way. Hey, so. I'm, I don't, I don't mind the sound of my own voice sometimes. Anyway, so as, as a lot of the listeners would know, so it's okay if you think there's something interesting that I could tell oh, you. For sure. <laughs> for sure. So you you came to us through Ben. You you met Ben. Uh, I think was he doing a session, a presentation? Is that what he was? Yeah, I um, I was asked. I think it was General Assembly in Melbourne. I was asked to facilitate a a session, and I think Ben uh, Ben was on it. And he mentioned that he's got a podcast, and we just kind of got to chatting about that. And he said, um, Yeah, if I'm in Sydney, uh, to drop by and we'll do a recording. So here we are. I'm glad you took him up on the offer. Yeah, absolutely. He um, he does a pretty good job on those things. Like he could literally run that as a business. The what with the success he's had with yeah. um, like corporates are coming up to him, going like, "Come and can you come and present to our people?" So he's getting and he's getting paid, and then he's getting clients out of it. And it's like, well, well what do you want? Yeah, so, um, yeah it's, pretty, a, it's a great gig, and he's great at it. As you yeah, as well. exactly. Yeah. You got to be good to get that attention. It's um, he's really got it nailed. He's 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 one of those guys that's sort of. When he learns, he learns, and he learns the right things, and he's targeted, and he goes and does stuff. He's not a learner that doesn't implement. He's like, teach me how to do it, and I will do it better than like 95% of people. That's yep. pretty much how he rolls. That's yeah. fucking awesome. It's great to have him on the team. <laughs> That's my advisor. <laughs> yeah, so so you're, you've got a bit of a – you've had a quite a journey in terms of your background. You had a startup business. You uh, – oh, you probably – the one that I know about, but there's, yeah. I'm sure there's a few different things that you've been doing. Where, where, like, how did you get to running the podcast? How did I get to running the podcast? So, um, I guess starting off, I uh, I was actually giving a talk yesterday at a place which was just a street over from um, from where I where I had my first job out of uni. Okay, and it was also my last corporate gig, um, so I hadn't been back there for six years. But um, essentially, I, you know, going back, I studied engineering and economics. Um, partly because my Indian parents told me to. Um, and, but I knew pretty quickly that it wasn't really what I wanted to do. And um, trying to tell your parents that you wanted to leave engineering and the double degree that you'd done to try and launch a fashion tech startup is a very interesting conversation to have. Yeah. But I, uh, I managed to negotiate with them that, uh, you know, if I stuck around for at least two years so I had something on my resume that they would essentially get off my back and let me do it. You just tell them it'll be worth lots of money and then they'll get, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, yeah. In, Indian parents have a, you know, have a very particular way of, of kind of looking, looking at the world. But um, no, my parents are super supportive, but essentially stayed there for two years, uh, jumped out, moved, uh, moved from Sydney to, to Melbourne um, because that's where the rest of my co-founders were. 
Um, we launched a company called Stage Label, which is a crowdfunding for fashion platform. Um, it was there for, I think, about, about three years. Um, over that time, we helped launch 150 different brands globally. Um, really, really uh, interesting experience going through that. A lot of, a lot of good lessons, um, even though it wasn't sort of the end result that we wanted from, from the company. Uh, jumped out and joined a not-for-profit organization called mm-hmm. Startup Vic, um, which is essentially there to develop the startup ecosystem. Okay. So we didn't have a CEO at that time, so I got to make up my role a little bit and uh, essentially just tried to meet with as many startups as possible and, and work out how I could be helpful. So Yeah, so that, that was like um, not necessarily a funding incubator, it was just a facilitation or try to guide startups. Yeah, so it's, it's just like, you know, the the entire kind of premise of, of that as an organization is to like how do we develop the ecosystem the community so that um we give the the startups that are looking to launch the best chance of success and uh so a lot of it was just events and initiatives i just you know met with them and tried to help them with growth and marketing which is a lot of my background um but also just helping them you know find co-founders connecting them onto investors um just generally trying to be useful where, where yeah, possible um, and then from that, uh, you know, I've just been very fortunate to have a lot of people that uh, were willing to say yes to, to coffee with me. And um, I hate taking notes. And so um, what I what I started to do, what, what I wanted to do was like, you know, selfishly just have a, a recording of some of the conversations that I was having. But also from my experience with Startup Victoria and just meeting with early stage startups, I just thought that there was a lot of the same type of questions coming up time and time again. Mm. Um, and I kind of felt a little bit selfish that I you know, was getting to talk to these incredible people and whether that's through a lack of access or networks or just didn't know these people existed, um, they were missing out on a lot of that information. So mm. the podcast very much for me was, um, you know, I wanted to um, have a reason to sit down with amazing people and, and pick their brain and, uh, you know, put it out as a resource. At the very worst case, no one would listen and I could refer back to it myself yeah. for my own education. Um, and, you know, best case, um, someone would sort of find it and, and listen and, and get something out of it. Yeah, it's super interesting running. Like, I when we first started out, we had no idea. Yeah. And it wasn't even like a... It was literally like... we It was like webinars that we started out with. So we'd be on Zoom and we'd, we'd have actually, you had to register for the webinar and we'd have the conversation. People, we'd had to have it interactive as well. We yeah. had people messaging and and some people really love that. But um, we just sort of found that uh, the the requirement around that whole process was a bit, a bit sort of, um, uh, you were very dependent on the guest's internet connection. Mm. And like, yeah, there was a lot of risks that started to come into it. We had sessions where they just dropped off offline um, and I'm just sitting there talking to myself, and so it's sort of, yeah. I think, I think the, way, the way we do it now is much better. Yeah, I, I like all of my record. I've done similar similar to you guys. Like I did a few recordings at the start with um, a few guests from overseas, and mm-hmm. I've had I do have a, a lot of international guests, but all of my recordings are in person now. Um, just because, like, the recording is just... It's just a much better conversation, I find. Oh, the, just, when we like, shift it, the face-to-face, yeah. face, like, especially when you've got... So sometimes we have more than just one-on-one, so, mm. like, three or four people. And when you're on, like, if you're not face-to-face, face, you can't clue... Everyone starts to talk over each, top of each other because you can't... You're not picking up on the, the senses that you can yeah. use when you're in the room with each other. Yeah. So it just really made that... Even, even with the one-to-one, because mm. you can just... It's the rhythm that you get when you're talking to people is so much better. It's, yeah, and you don't have, like, as you mentioned, the, the lag to deal with where you don't know when to stop and start. And just it's a very stunted and, and awkward sort of conversation. Mm. Yeah. yeah, it's much easier to keep it um, uh, natural, I guess, when you... But, but yeah. what you're talking about, like, the, just the interest of being able to just... It's like having a... When you go over a conversation, so you're talking about those people that um, you would be meeting with. And, like, if no one's there sort of um, on, like, sort of you've got no people watching, you're like, well, you could... You, your conversation may not be as useful or interesting. Mm. Like, you probably found that once you started having an audience, you're like, shit, I better make sure I ask the right questions. I better make sure it's, like, valuable. Like, Yeah. Um, so my, my podcast ends up... Um, so, like, I literally was not expecting anyone to listen to this at all. I was like, I'll just do this for a while and then, and then I'll you know figure it out but uh, the podcast picked up a lot of steam very quickly so it hit number three on iTunes for its category like three days after launching yeah, or something awesome. like how that. long has it been going for? Uh, two and a half years now yeah, cool. so um, yeah just published episode 97 this week yeah, nice. so I took a few months off last year but aside from that it's been a, a weekly show for the last two and a half years, which is, um, we're talking about sort of consistency with this mm. stuff, it can get really difficult but um, yeah I, I think that you know it it's kind of nice to have 
people listening to the show. But as you said, it's also sometimes a little bit, um, especially when you're starting out and you're just new to the process, it can get a little bit daunting of going, how do I make sure I don't stuff this up mm. for people? Well, it's, uh, I guess if we think about like the people out there listening, the advisors, a lot of advisors are starting to get in different ways of engaging with their uh, their client base, their existing client base and perspective. So you've got advisors out there that are starting podcasts and uh, and increasingly, which is really cool because um, we've I've, I know a couple of uh, Glenn James is uh, I can't remember exactly what it is. It's not my I'm not the target market, but he he does um, does amazing. Like he's just shot to and it's a it's a direct to consumer sort of podcast and yeah. and like it's it's such a it's obviously a really good way of people to consume information. Yeah, oh, absolutely. I mean, so um, one thing I didn't mention is that uh, a lot of people assume that podcasting is my full time job um, just because I've been doing it for so long, but. Um, for me, it's, it's very much still a hobby and, and a creative outlet. Um, most of my time goes into an agency that I, a digital marketing agency that I yeah, run cool. called Playbook Media. Um, and you know, a large part of our client base or our leads come from the podcast. Not because I, I think it's I've only mentioned my my business maybe two or three times on the show itself, but. Um, a lot of it just comes from the a the conversations that we have, so like the guests that are, that come on the show. Mm. Um, it just helps us develop a relationship, and whether that's directly through the agency or other work that we can do together. Uh, but also when I'm going to meet with potential clients, especially um, you know it's, it is a small community and, and a small ecosystem. Um, most people have sort of heard of the show in some capacity. It just helps in terms of the sales process because they feel like they already know you. Mm. Um, and it's just it's just been such a uh, I w- I never started the podcast. From any form of like I want to start a business off the back of this or I want to drive it uh, use it to drive leads but um, it's been like the single biggest um, it's had the single biggest impact in terms of growth for our business um, just from from having doing doing this exercise yeah that's great yeah, yeah it's 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 as, as we with x5 visor it's just like you start something out that you just think is a cool sort of let's do this this will be fun and then all of a sudden like you got people that are listening you're like shit they, they think what we say is interesting or they think our guests are interesting and and then you all of a sudden you're, you're going oh I never thought I'd be able to get that person on and a lot of the time all you got to do is ask someone and they're, they're happy to jump on like it's really it's been a phenomenal experience to go to sort of break through what you think you could um, the people you can engage with like yeah oh absolutely like I think it's um I think it just applies to like all areas of business really it's um, if you don't ask for something you're never really going to get it in in my sort of opinion and uh, or from my background anyways and so uh, you know a lot of people in, in this very similar posi- position it's like you know how did you get um, Jason Calacanis who was the first investor into Uber um, on the show or people like Paul Bassett um, who is the head of Seek and, and Square Pay Capital and, and those sort of things? Um, and a lot of it is just like uh, you know sometimes it's it's referrals based on uh, other people that I've had on the show and making sure that they have a positive experience so they're much more likely to to refer me on. But sometimes I've like literally just tweeted at people and said, "Hey, I've got this podcast. Are you interested in coming on?" Mm. Um, and you know, obviously you, you get a lot of no's, but you just need a couple of yeses to to be useful, and you can always leverage that for for more things in the future. Oh, totally. Like, the connections are fantastic. Like, so some of these guys that you've had on, what are, yeah. like you, you talk about their business journeys, some of the, like you've had some guys that have would have had some, I guess, some really big fuck-ups in there. In there. Like, what are some of the, the most amazing stories that you've had when you've... Yeah, I, so, I mean, I, I think that one of my favorite things about running a podcast like this and I'd be curious to know if this is your experience as well is you know uh, everyone's got a very different journey Uh, everyone's got a story and and everything's slightly different and so you know there was um, Adam Jacobs who is the head of the iconic Mm -hmm. the the fashion brand yeah yeah. Um, like they'll ship in the next day or whatever yeah. yeah and so he kind of spoke about how that was like a key point of difference and people were like like how is this even possible um, type of situation but you know he was essentially headhunted for this position from a co- so the iconic was already funded by a business overseas called rocket internet which essentially funds large businesses and finds amazing operators to come in and run those businesses as the founders uh, and so he was one of those people and so the challenge for him was like do i leave my corporate job and go and pursue this mm. sort of opportunity uh, versus someone like justin dry who is the ceo of a company called vinomofo oh uh, yeah yeah oh we I've, Clay and I have actually looked at their website going, that is such an amazing, like, they've nailed it in their market, like you would know from a marketing standpoint, like the yeah. frictionless and the, 
Yeah. It's wine. For anyone that doesn't know it, check it out, Vito Mofo. It's it's good. They do, like, discount wine. They do, they do discount wine, yeah. But, um, you know, and they're hugely successful now. So I think when he was uh, guest number three on my show, and uh, at that time they'd just raised $20 million, and obviously, you know, they've gone on to, like, Justin's hugely popular on, on social media, and, and he's great at that. But uh, it was really interesting kind of talking to him and going, you know, obviously everyone kind of looks at the success and, um, you know, the $20 million raise and, and all of those sort of things. But we had four years and four different pivots of our business where we tried different business models and, um, you know, it just wasn't like nothing was working. And his um, co-founder at that time was, um, his partner was Justin's sister. And so he was saying how like um, his his sister was asking him whether they would have enough like money for, you know, presents and, and Christmas and stuff. And it's like, you, you don't get to hear that side of the story a lot of the times. It's not right. something that's, you know, pushed that much in, in the media, especially when you do have a big success off, off the back of that. So, um, yeah, like, I, you know, I think there's, uh, there's this, um, to a degree, like a misconception that, you know, we, like, just because something looks really great on paper, it's been smooth sailing and, and things are perfect. Um, even with, with my company, Stage Label, for example, um, you know, we had all of these really positive things, um, you know, we were doing our own runway shows at Melbourne Spring Fashion Week and Virgin Australia Melbourne Fashion Festival. Um, we were named as one of the top 10 startups to watch in 2014 alongside companies like Canva, uh, which is now worth over a billion dollars. Yeah, wow. And, and that the, is that the first unicorn Australia's had? Uh, Australia's had a few. It's it's the latest one. So uh, Atlassian, oh, obviously, Atlassian, yeah. uh, a big one. But um, I think Canva is one of the, the more recent ones that have been sort of based in, in Australia. Um but, you know, I mean, like, we had no we had no business being on that list. And, um, you know, again, from all of the the photos and, like, Uber was a sponsor of ours for, like, yeah. events and things like that, there's, there's a certain impression that you get of what a company is looking like and what it's kind of operating. And there's a, a very different um, sort of experience. As mo- anyone who's running a business <laughs> will probably attest to. These can look great. They'd not be so good underneath. Yeah, yeah. and um, yeah, I think it's. I think that was a really big thing for me of, of kind of going through that process is that you know um, you assume that things are really easy for all of these companies that have um, you know billion dollar exits and things like that. Mm. Um, but everyone goes through through a struggle, um, and it's super challenging. I, I had someone on recently, um, Tom uh, Tom Crago, mm-hmm. who runs a company called Tantalus Media. Um, that was the one I was listening to. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. He's the one. He bought into a. Uh, oh, sorry. He he got. Um, he became the the CEO of a business, and got into the door, and they told him they had like five hundred thousand dollars tax bill or something. Yeah. <laughs> so he, uh, yeah. So essentially, he, uh, as a twenty five year old, um, went to go and pitch to this company and said, you know, I think you're struggling with uh, with business and sales. I can help you with that. So make me the CEO and give me ten percent of your business. And the founders were like, okay, that's that's great. Like, that sounds fine. Go ahead. And he's like, well, that's interesting. And then, um, yeah, he found out a few weeks in that, that they had a half a million dollar tax bill to the ATO, um, which he was now responsible for. And he gave himself like six months to, to turn that around. And now, you know, um, I think it's like 12 or 13 years later, they're making um, games for like Zelda and something like it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's different. And again, you know, if you come across that company now, it's like, wow, these guys are incredible and doing all of these amazing things. But everyone's got that story. Mm, well, I think uh, I think most advisors out there are feeling like they're going through that story right now. But their tax bill in this, um, to make it a bit of an analogy, is probably like $2 million that they're trying to figure out how to get out of. Mm. So it's... Um, well, I don't know how much you've sort of heard about the, the Royal Commission. And I have, yeah. It's, uh, yeah, it's not pretty. It's pretty, like, it's... Um, I think a lot of uh, businesses that have traditionally been uh, the way of going about their business has been quite set in what's what clients see value in and what they deliver and what what happens has been sort of pretty stable. Um, but there's been change. Obviously, there's been change over the last few years, but this is nothing as big as what's about to play through in terms of um, there's education requirements for advisors that are just really like master's level um, requirements for even for people that already have um, education so there's a, there's a whole lot of requirements there there's um, a bit of a bar exam you might say that's coming yeah. through so there's all that going on and then there's a whole a big disruption to business model in terms of commissions for um, for how they get paid for their advice and it's an huge increase in the cost to, to serve so the cost to provide their services because of compliance so mm-hmm. 
a lot of a lot of challenges for for business models. And uh, like we were talking about Ben's business before, obviously he's um, like he's playing in a in a space where um, he can charge a bit more. He's got a he's got a really good target um, target demographic. They see value in what his proposition is, and, and they're happy to pay um, the fees that he charges. But a lot of advisors are used to service, servicing, um, like a more average Australian, you might mm. say, that that doesn't have the capacity to pay um, certain amounts, or uh, well, yeah, it just doesn't have the capacity really. It's um, and I think a lot of businesses are struggling to go. Okay, well, actually. I need to put my prices up, but then I need to, that means I need to service someone else. Mm. Um, alternatively, to keep the prices down, as there's a quite a significant um, technology adaption or adoption that needs to go on. Yep. And a lot of businesses aren't geared up to do it. It's just sort of, yeah. You got any answers for that? Like, <laughs> I, that's my rant for I, I unfortunately <laughs> don't have. Well, I mean. Um, you know, and, and this is obviously very easy for me to say um, because I don't have to, to face it every day um, in the same way that, that um, advisors and, and potential people that are listening would. But I think that it also does create a lot of uh, a lot of opportunity um, within that space. So um, what I mean by that is, you know, uh, having a low, uh, relatively low barrier to entry and making it easier for people to come in just means... Um, there's generally more, a lot more competition mm. for things. So it's easy for you to get in, but more competition that you have to, to deal with. Uh, but an economics degree coming through. Yeah, <laughs> but um, but obviously if you have, uh, you know, if you have kind of higher barriers to entry, it does, and you can overcome that. If you can overcome that, um, it does create a really interesting opportunity as well. And I think what you just mentioned about adoption of technology is, um, you know, maybe this is just a, a catalyst for, for people to think a, a little bit differently around sort of business models. It's so easy to get, um, you know, stuck into the rhythm of things. Um, again, we were kind of talking about that a little bit mm. easier when, you know, you get into a process of, of kind of doing things and, and your business is just kind of working and you're just kind of taking things over. It's very easy to get into that comfort zone. Mm. Um, and sometimes you just need that little bit of a catalyst to go, you know, is this is this the best possible way of, of kind of doing things or is there a, a different way? Hmm. Um, and again, not to say that any of this is, is easy by, by any means and um, not to obviously trivialize a lot of the things that people are going through. But um, yeah, I think there's, uh, I, I, you know, it's, it's one of those kind of things with, with investment. The best time to invest is when everything else is crashing down around you. And blood's on um, the street. And blood's on the street. So, um, you know, again, very easy for me to say, but um, if, if it is possible, I, I would say, like, you know, if there is a way to sort of look at this as an opportunity to, to completely change the outlook on your business. Um, totally. Yeah. Well, I think, I think that entrepreneurial mindset is, I guess, where, where I was making the link is, like, I guess entrepreneurs and the people that you're listening to, even though no matter how successful they become, what their job is is to deal with, like, punches in the face pretty much and go shit how do I dodge the punch next time or how do I recover quickly quicker from that punch and so that, like I guess especially in the current environment for the, the competitive nature of startups in the world and the the speed of change like the ability to pivot and change and adopt and keep an open mindset is what I'm presuming uh, from what I've been gathering from business is is what keeps things going and I think that's probably one of the big the mindset shift of advisors that are, I guess, are experiencing this change now is probably one of the hardest things. It's like I didn't sign up to like like pivot my business model. This is this is my business plan. I had this ready to go. This is how I was going to be going for the next ten like fifteen years. So that that whole mindset shift, I think, is one of the biggest challenges. And, and yeah. what you said around opportunity is like that's huge. That that's really if you can shift into that positivity of the opportunity, it starts to get the the what do you call it? the connections between the um, the nerves nerves going the synapses yep. connecting and the the neurons around the brain firing a bit differently. Um, and maybe another thing you could do is just probably listen to Rhodes podcast, the, the startup <laughs> playbook, and start to get in that entrepreneur mindset. Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> you know, honestly, like it's it is it is really difficult, and like I said. I, you know, whether it's advice, whether it's technology startups, whether it's, you know, a retail store, everyone goes through um, getting punched in the face almost on a daily basis. And, uh, you know, I think one of the one of the things that's helped me is just having other people around me who I can sort of talk to or, or communicate around these things. Because, uh, again, it's very easy to, to have a very insular 
outlook on these things, especially mm. when it's your when it's your business. Um, you know, a not a lot of people understand or relate to that, um, and so it can get very easy to get down on yourself and think that you're the only person who's going through these things, and mm-hmm. you have you you know your business plan didn't work because the plan that you came up with was terrible or, or all of these sort of things. But um, it's just, you know, a fact of, of doing business is that this is just going to constantly happen over and over again. And uh, being able to overcome that is is what kind of, um, as you mentioned, you know, um, is, is kind of a key aspect of businesses that sort of stand the test of time and, and become successful. I think it's the same thing for, like, for me with the podcast as well was you know i i don't necessarily think that my podcast is that amazing i've got friends who are podcasters who spend so much more time on like editing and post-production and all of these things and i i think that their podcast sounds so much better but um you know for for whatever reason they just didn't get the traction early on or, or those sort of things and they stop mm. uh you know uh, 20 30 40 episodes in um where for me like it took me nine months of putting out episodes every single week for me to see any form of a return on, on investment on that. And mm-hmm. it's like, if I came, came in for, came in for a different reasons or I stopped a week earlier or like those sort of things, maybe I, I wouldn't have stuck around long enough to kind of see that upside. Um, so yeah, I think like just finding ways to, um, to have a different perspective on things because everyone goes through it. Um, just really, really helps with, um, staying consistent with it and, and sticking with it long the term. Yeah. The, I guess the, what you're talking about before in terms of reaching out and and like making i guess making use of your community or and or even just just making connections in your community and that, uh, that's exactly what xy advice is about like if you still talk about what you're talking about you going through that journey on your own to an extent the mm. podcast journey we we've always been we've had a bit of a group so it's always supported that journey that like it having other people with you or understanding what you're going through and um, being on the journey. It just, it's so powerful in terms of supporting uh, getting to the destination. <laughs> and I think um, a lot of the advisors that, especially when we look at the Facebook group and what goes on there, the guys that are, are working through, pushing through their problems, they're the guys that reach out and ask for help on the Facebook group. Mm. And they get it. They get it straight away. And... And I guess, all, like all, I wish is that I, I or I hope that um, a lot of a lot of people that are um, in the Facebook group they derive value off that, which is fantastic. But I, I would definitely encourage them, the ones that are sort of not nailing what their problem is, mm. because someone hasn't talked about it, they're missing out by not asking about it because it's a very it's a very friendly facebook group we emily spends a lot of time moderating and and really you'd argue the people that don't ask for help don't don't get it and yeah that's sort of uh, I, I the only thing that i would add to that because I, I agree with everything you just said um the only thing that i would add to that is also um when you're in a better position being able to go and help other people during their time of need and it sounds like you have an amazingly supportive facebook group to, to do that anyways but um i remember for me like actually aside from the podcast one other kind of pivotal moment for me was um when i ended up moving away from stage label i got offered the i, I ended up taking the not-for-profit position but that paid me half of another job offer that i got wow. but i ended That'd up be cool yeah well i i um my girlfriend jokes around that i actually hate money and i always take <laughs> take the offers that pay me less um but make it harder <laughs> make it make it harder i am apparently a, a sucker for punishment but <laughs> Um, for me, it was, you know, I had benefited so much from a lot of the initiatives that that organization had run when I had first moved to Melbourne. And, you know, I was like, I'm not really working on anything. So this is my way of sort of giving back to the community. But also, uh, you know, I knew that being in a position to help other people would, I had no no networks at that time at all, really. And so being in a position where, like, literally my job was to work out how I can help other people is the quickest way to develop sort of goodwill relationships and things like that. That I, I had no idea what I wanted to do next. I just knew that I um, that it was important to, to help people and just have a, a good network in place. And that was um, one of the best things that, that's kind of happened. And I, I sort of can try and continue to do that as much as possible. Um, is it... Is that skill set that you're developing during that process? Is it? Is it? I guess being being able to see the value of someone on the other side of the table, so to speak. Is that? Is that sort of what was being developed? That sort of um, if you're thinking about business partnerships or who you're going who you're working with as a client, what do they want to get out of this interaction? What do they want to get out of um, purchasing this service? Is that is that the sort of skill set that you're talking um, about? Or, yeah. or more just general people. Like, yeah, I, I guess. Uh I don't know. Like, I, I just feel like I have a very long-term outlook in life in general. And um, 
So I, I think a, a lot of it for me is I uh, I don't I try not to view things as kind of transactions. So it's mm. not. Um, I'm not talking to this person because I want to get a sale from them straight away. And if I don't get a sale, then I'm not going to talk to them. I'm going to talk to the next person. Mm. I think it's just more about um, what does this kind of look like longer term. And my, my like personal belief is always, you know, um, like the number of times I go to events and people are just like handing out business cards and you have no idea who that person is because you haven't spoken to them. You haven't, you haven't created a connection yet. You haven't yet. created that <laughs> connection. And so for me, it's just like uh, I, I've I run and I've run a lot of events previously and I remember that there was a lot of, um, a lot of interns uh, or kind of students that, that used to be involved with those events who would um, have ridiculous access to all of the speakers, the people that um, everyone in the crowd wanted to get in touch with. But mm. as soon as they found out that they were just an intern or just a student, they would walk away and not not really give them the time of day because they didn't deem them to be valuable. Um, but I think all of this stuff comes off in the end, whether that's you know a client, whether that's someone that you will sort of end up hiring for your business, whether it's someone who will potentially introduce you down the track. I think... Um, being a good person is just always like the best thing to do mm. um and yeah i i just feel like there's a lot more value in kind of the longer term benefit that you'll get from from helping someone than kind of the short term um short term transaction that you'll get from from trying to help people where do you where do you think i guess this i guess it sounds like you've had this sort of way of thinking for a while where do you think it's come from like a um I don't know, like, honestly, like, I think a lot of it is is my parents, especially yeah. my mum. She is definitely uh, a people person. And, um, you know, when I was younger, I she she's always been, um, you know, very, very hands-on with things. So she used to, like, um, make uh, kind of fake flowers out of wax and things like that and go to, like, weekend markets and um, and try and sell them. And I There's used the to... entrepreneurial... Story. Yeah. And, <laughs> and so, like, I, I used to go with her and, like, stand w- with her at the store and, like, I wouldn't even really be doing anything. I would just, like, watch her and how she would interact and engage with people. And, like, even now she's got a restaurant um, in Canberra and, um, you know, it's not um, it's not very large and or anything like that, but she developed such a strong relationship with all of these people that then become you know, word of mouth for her to get new people and they'll keep in returning. Um, You know, food's amazing, but more than the food, uh, everyone comments about how they really like and how they feel special uh, around those sort of things. And so I think it's just something that I was always um, ingrained in. Hmm. Uh, It's it's just always been like... There's an an example that was set from from early. Yeah, I, I think I think that's a lot of where it sort of comes from. It like I you know again we were talking about this a little bit earlier. Like I I feel like I do a lot of things that don't make sense to a lot of people. So starting a podcast, I can, I can relate to that. Though. Starting a podcast for for some reason, but it's it's always like I can um, you know in my mind I, I see the value of something two three steps ahead versus I'm doing a podcast now because three months from now it will it will result in X. Um, and I think as long as you can you have your own sort of understanding of why you're doing something. Um, or like the purpose or the reason behind it and you can sort of commit to it and it's not fake um, you know I, I think it all well, that's, that's what you come up against when it does get difficult yeah and if it doesn't have the right foundations of the intent and the the passion then it's quite easy to to yeah. discontinue yeah and i mean like you know again like it's it's not to say that i'm like this all the time as well there's so many different projects or businesses that i've gone that i've gone that i've said you know this is a great way to you know i think it's a really great commercial opportunity and mm. you know we'll try this and it potentially doesn't go the way that i kind of want so i like we'll dump it and, and move on to something else but you know so i i think everyone's got um everyone's got kind of um, taste for that but I think a lot of that comes down to like what is the authentic reason or like what is the intent behind something is really important so again coming back to the podcast episode for me the intent wasn't ever to have a huge audience or to have um, you know use it as a as a way to get new clients or anything like that I didn't even have a business at that time mm. um, it was more I just wanted to do this for myself I'm naturally very introverted so I just wanted to get better at communicating with people and you know have a reason to want to like speak to all these people and try and learn from it and mm. if anyone listened to it great but that wasn't even the intention behind that so if people stopped listening for whatever reason i would still do it the guests wouldn't know that no one's listening <laughs> um but it would just be a way for me to just constantly keep learning from all of these amazing people and um you know i think if you always kind of bring things back to what is the reason why you started that mm. in the first place and if it's for you know the right reasons um it helps you push through a lot of the the challenging times yeah totally i think i think the interesting thing that's coming to mind when you're talking about um 
the difference between the intent of starting something and the out of a passion or a values sort of channel versus reacting um, to to a situation or a circumstance that's that's emerging within your business or in your personal situation. And that's it's it's the challenge. How do you? Um, I think that's probably a challenge if you think about what's going on with advisors at the moment. How do you drive through um, through a challenging time without um, while actually still pursuing activity that is in line with the values and the activities that you want to be doing or what you feel strongly about, um, and not pivoting to do something just because shit um, we're losing money, we've got to do something. It's like it's that's that balance is really hard. I think it's yeah. Uh, I mean, um, financial stress is is really really difficult uh, to to deal with. Um, and again, like I won't, I won't say that I, um, like I, I just don't have the answers to everything, and I can only kind of talk about my own experience. But you know, with Stage Label, uh, I had essentially, um, I'd moved from Sydney to Melbourne. I'd left a bunch of my friends behind. I had um, ended up breaking up with my girlfriend of four years, quit my job, and put all of my life savings into the company that I thought was going to be really big, and in the end, it, it wasn't. We did okay, but it wasn't, and. Um, you know, I, I was kind of left with having no money, and even though I got those two job offers, it was a couple of months between me ending Sage Label and getting those two job offers, and so I had like no idea what I was going to do, and mm. I was running out of money very quickly. And um, like that was definitely one of the most kind of challenging, um, challenging periods of of my life. But also, um, you kind of realise that you, although it's kind of worst case scenario, it's also not the worst thing in the world that can happen to you there's so many more people that are going through much worse things in life uh, that you can always get get an, get another job you can always go and do something if if cash flow is is kind of the the biggest um barrier to your happiness or, or you kind of living uh living through things but um that to me is, is always uh, I think it's you, the the ego but is the it, one that absolutely gotta... it's it's the ego but again it's you know um I, I know when i ended up shutting down stage level i was like this is really difficult because my whole identity is tied down mm. to this thing it's like you're known as that fashion tech guy right like you go and do all of these events like what's happening with that uh it's it's not a thing anymore yeah. um, and that's that that is really really tough to go through but again um, you know the way that I sort of looked at it was or the way that I kind of experienced that was you know my friends didn't look at me any differently because I was running a startup where I wasn't um, most of the people that I cared about didn't really ha- it, it didn't really affect their life mm. in, in any way it was just more my what I thought that other how other people would perceive me and if you base your entire happiness on how other people are going to perceive you based on what you're potentially doing, there is no way to, to – I don't think that there's a way to become happy with that because you're always going to be pleasing people that at the end of the day don't really give a shit about you anyways. And if people are – if people around you are being affected by that or they do treat you differently, that's probably a pretty good indication that they're not the type of people that you want in your life anyway. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so, so I, I think that the biggest thing for me was like I kind of saw um, worst case scenario – and I was like, it was terrible and it was shit, but actually, like, I got through that. Mm. And if need be, I can, I know that, like, having gone through it before, I can kind of go through it again um, and hopefully be a little bit better. Not that I want to, but it's just more knowing that um, whatever you think your worst case scenario is, um, just putting that into the context mm. of things. Like, it's actually, it's actually not that bad. And, um, you know, like I said, the, the, the one of the big things for me as well with, um, with the podcast is you kind of learn from all of these people that have built these huge companies that uh, just because they're making revenue doesn't mean that their problems go away. Their problems become different mm. and they magnify because now the stakes are so much higher and it mm. becomes more and more stressful over time. Yeah. That, that stress doesn't go away no. at all. It just evolves. It better, better get evolves to over time. Learn to deal with it. Because yeah. it's it's a status quo, sort of exactly thing. right. So uh, yeah, again, um, you know, it's it's very very easy for me to like say this for other people that are going through this right now. Um, just uh, having gone, having experienced something similar myself, um, I just know that uh, you know you, you will if you stick it long enough, you will get through the other side. Mm. And whether it's this or whether it's something else, you'll find a way way through that. 
Well, a simple analogy that's coming to mind is uh, my sister recently. She's got a completely different direction than me. She's a performer and um, in one of the fringe festivals. And um, she, had a, she had a show. She had a, like, the, the first night was, um, it was, she had a crowd. She's like, oh, everyone laughed at the jokes. And they, there was a good, there was a great session. The next night, there was a lot smaller crowd, like tiny. And, um, and she was just like, so demoralized. Like, so, from that huge high to that drop and then the next night after I'm like I'm talking to her and I'm like well remember remember when when you started and where you all you wanted to do is be where you are now have a think about that and yeah. just remember why why you're doing this and like she did she said like it's it's nice to be able to do a bit of a big brother mother moment I, I'm no, I haven't always been good at that but for to, after that she came back and she said well it, yeah, it made a difference so it's like that that's sort of remembering why that you why you're here why you're doing it I think that's a that's a key one to keep people driving through uh, I absolutely I mean um you know again going back to the stage label example um I remember like I had just gotten off the phone with one of our, our first few designers that had jumped off our platform so like long story short, one of the big issues with our platform was that we provided a whole heap of value up front for, for designers. Um, you know, they came to us with next to no resources, we would help them with marketing, pricing, supply chain, just everything. Um, and then they would get to a stage where they we had helped them build up an audience and they would say, Well, we've kind of gotten everything that we need, we don't really need your platform, we don't need to pay you a clip for, for sales through through here anymore, so we're just gonna jump off and do our own thing exceptionally hard to build uh to scale or or like build a business if your top sellers are are jumping off every few months but i had just gotten off the phone with one of the first few designers that had jumped off and i was like oh this is terrible how are we going to overcome this and then i uh i saw a tweet about the top 10 startups to watch in 2014 i was like oh i you know one day hopefully we'll kind of make it onto this list or whatever so like i opened the thing um and we were number three on that on that platform i was like what the hell? And I was on this huge, huge high, like literally, literally <laughs> in the confused. space, literally in the space of, of ten minutes. But uh, again, for me, it was also you know, the the whole kind of article was great. Uh, having some validation was great, but um, just having that on its own, like so many startups that I know chase um, chase PR, for example, mm. because it's it's often the first time that you have to actually um, show other people who aren't involved in your business, like look at me, I'm doing something great, mm. but having press and running a successful business is not the same thing. No. Um, and, you know, it's it, it kind of taught me a lot about, you know, whatever other people's impressions are, it really doesn't doesn't matter. I have no control over that. I could, you know, having great articles will give them positive spin, having negative articles will give them a negative spin, but at the end of the day, that doesn't and shouldn't change who I am as a person and, and what it is that I'm sort of working on. And so I think that kind of has also helped me... Um, through that entire process of like trying to take away what other people's perception of of me is and not having to rely on like my own happiness for how I think other people will will react to mm. me. No, I mean that external validation requirement. Mm. Yeah, it's pretty important. Yeah. Well, right, mate, it's been great to have you on. Thanks for, thanks for having there, me. It's- is, there, is there anything, I guess, uh, the Startup Playbook, obviously, it's a podcast for people to check out. I listened to one of the sessions and it's pretty cool. Like it's it's got a great style um, and some really interesting people. Anything else that uh, what's your marketing business that you? Yeah, um, so it's called Playbook Media. Um, we're essentially a digital marketing agency, digital marketing and creative agency. So everything from um, helping you with sort of digital marketing and, sa- and sales funnel optimization to um, you know helping you with the sort of creative content and storytelling. So helping businesses land launch. Um, things like branded podcasts or uh, video series that we then help them filter out um, blog posts and social media posts at the back of that um, that feeds into their marketing strategy. Yep. Um, just, uh, again, sort of essentially helping companies grow. So um, how to maybe acquire some uh, new financial planning clients? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So a lot of it is, um, you know, just based on a lot of what we do is on customer acquisition, um, retention of, of customers and, and those sort of things. So I do that through the agency. I also do um, some consulting work for, for companies one on one as well. So one of the things that I sort of found is that it's not always the case for for people to hire agencies uh, and mm-hmm. kind of all of the bells and whistles that, that come with that. Um, but there was a, a huge scope of, of working with kind of small businesses that I could help them teach what they needed to know and keep that some of that information retention in-house mm. um, and then be able to kind of leverage on that and work with them to kind of 
understand and, and grow that over time. So, um, yeah, I've just started kicking off just more of a consulting sort of gig with that too. But, um, yeah, if anyone's interested, the the links are playbookmedia.com.au and uh, my uh, my email address is rohit at startupplaybook.co um, if you're interested in getting in touch. But, once again, thanks for the thanks for having me on the show. Hope it was useful, and um, yeah, it's always interesting being on on the other side of <laughs> on the other side of this. That's been a pleasure. Thank you. Awesome, mate. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs>